The copy and paste culture of Wait. YouTube. I feel like this is really going to speak to me, man. Let's hear Plagiarism it. Plagiarism is a... By the way, shout out to Colin and Samir before we get started. They do an awesome series where they interview creators. They do podcasts where they get to talk to some of the, like, the most popular influencers right now. These guys are like awesome, awesome creators. I highly recommend you guys watch them. Plagiarism is a big problem on YouTube right now. There are creators who are stealing titles, stealing thumbnails, and Wait. even... On YouTube right now, there are creators who are stealing titles, stealing thumbnails, <laughs> and even scripts, literally word for word. For the next 24 hours, the biggest YouTubers in the world will be controlling my life, starting with Mr. Beast. This is something that happened to Ryan Trahan, and he called us to just talk about, like, what is the solution to this? How should he feel? Oh my God, even better. Ryan's in this video. I found him. Uh, someone just tweeted me a guy who made a short basically copying my short word for word and also the plot that genuinely happened in my real life. No one has actual originality, I understand that, but there's definitely a thing of plagiarism that feels like those are actually my thoughts in my head. You just uh, Ryan's too humble, man. People do have original thoughts and the original experiences is the fact that it happened to you in that moment, I think is what makes it original. I, I get what he's kind of arguing in this like, pure, you know, abstract meta concept of like nothing that happens to you has not ever happened before throughout the history of humanity. And it's like, yeah, that's technically true, but it's like for the sake of like content creation, the way you're going to put to get together with your personality and the way you're going to articulate it and the way you're going to thread the story and the way that you're going to script it is going to be unique and the time period that you do it in, you know? Just took ownership of. And it, it just felt so weird. And I was kind of just like bummed out by it. How do we, how do we stop this? So we decided to reach out to the guy who wrote the book on plagiarism. His name is Austin Cleon, and the book is titled Steal Like an Artist. We wanted to understand, first off, why is this happening? Second, how can creators be original when it feels like everything's already been done? And then lastly, what's at stake for our community if we just continue going down this path? I am, I want to answer those questions. Either we'll answer them as we go along or I'll answer them at the end of, of the video. This is going to be a long one. and stealing without any repercussions. If you're new here, this is Colin. I'm Samir. Make sure you subscribe. If you're not new here, hello. Good to see you again. Hey guys. All right. Now for our conversation with Austin Cleon. I would love to get a chance to talk to these guys one day. These guys are awesome. Well, yeah, we wanted to dig in specifically with you um, on the topic of plagiarism and, and <laughs> some stuff that's going on, you know, on YouTube. What was the concept behind Steal Like an Artist? Sure. The big idea of the book for me was that there's honor amongst thieves, that if you're mm. going to steal, you need to steal. There's a right way to steal and there's a wrong way to steal. Um, the great artist steals in this very true. particular way. Yeah, I think that's a, a good start for, you know, asking what are some of the right ways to steal? All right, what are the elements right. of Right. stealing like an artist where it is on that side of the line that is okay and honorable. So I kind of equate this to clickbait. This is more of like a terminology thing that people get caught up in, but people kind of throw around the term clickbait in a negative way, when I don't think it really is negative. People will argue that like, oh, your titles are too clickbaity. I'm not saying people say this to me, but they'll say this to YouTube content creators. They're like, uh, you, you have clickbaity titles. When I feel like uh, a lot of times clickbaiting is good. You want your title as a content creator to be clickbaity. I, the way I define clickbaity is you just want it to be enticing for the user to click on. I think where clickbaiting gets bad is when you tempt the user to click on your video and then the video is not related in any way, shape or form to the thumbnail or the title, or you as a viewer feel like you kind of got scammed, right? You feel like you click on a video, you're like, oh, wow, this looks really, really cool. Like maybe the thumbnail is like some guy jumping out of a plane, right? And you know, it shows like 30,000 feet or something ridiculous, right? And then you open, you click on the video and you watch it and it turns out it's just some guy that jumped out of like a fake plane on a movie set and the plane was only like 100 feet off the ground. You might feel a little cheated, right? In a situation like that. And I feel like that's the distinction between like clickbait and misleading clickbait content. Well, I'm a visual guy. I have the visual right here from the book, the, the good theft versus bad theft. So you hear all the time, you hear that phrase like, oh, imitation is the most sincerest form of flattery. It's like, no, it's not. Anyone who's ever been imitated knows that is not how it feels <laughs> when you're being <laughs> imitated, right? It does not feel flattering whatsoever. What's flattering is transformation. When somebody takes something and they expand upon it or they use it as just 
just a little building block to further things. So there's a kind of way that people can think about this, whether you're transforming versus like imitating. The easiest way to not be an imitator really is to not just steal from one person, but to steal from a dozen, you know, people. Um, mm -hmm. Billy Collins, the poet, he says, you know, people are always being told to find your sense. voice. Well, the way you find your voice is that you imitate about a dozen voices and then something comes out of that that's mm -hmm. uniquely your own. I think that can also speak to how a lot of content creators start their YouTube journey. Like I know when I first started, I mean, I've been doing YouTube content for a very long time. If you guys go back to some of my early stuff, there's time periods where I'm heavily imitating Syndicate and saying a lot of things that he said because he was the first content creator that I ever watched. And then when I started watching like TBNR Frags, you'll see some elements of me imitating him. And I started watching him and Kenny play like Black Ops Call of Duty PC content way back in the day. And then once I started really getting into watching like Tim the Tapman in like the H1Z1 days, right? Like you'll see elements of me imitating that guy. And then I feel like as it just kind of like I grew up and I felt more comfortable with who I was as a person and I got more comfortable in front of a camera and I made thousands of videos and did thousands of pieces of content, you just get to a point where you just like, you know, it's almost more work to try to imitate somebody else at that point. Once you get to like a certain place, it's just easier just to kind of like be yourself. But that only happens once you get comfortable kind of being in front of a camera and you get comfortable with who you are, which I was not when I first started. It's an ethos thing of where you're trying with your work not to just bring yourself forward, but you're trying to bring everybody in your whole scene or your craft or, or your audience. You're trying to bring everything forward, right? Like Jimi Hendrix, he's an alien from another pan planet, right? He just lands <laughs> and, and like, you know, plays guitar and blows everyone's Amazing. minds and then he's out of here. Then you find out that, you know, he has this, you know, he's taking in every blues record he can. He's playing the Chitlin circuit. He's playing with all these different musicians. He's working up all this stuff. Um, and that what looks, uh, you know, what, what looks like total originality is actually this kind of mashup of all these influences <laughs> that he's kind of letting into his work. And so that was the real light bulb is that the way towards originality is by actually, you know, borrowing from all these different things and mashing it up into your own thing. I think what we're seeing today, especially across YouTube, is that there is a formula for success and there's actually basically no consequence for plagiarizing or like exactly right. replicating someone's uh, video. And the example that yeah. we emailed over to you, I don't know if you checked. In fact, I think it can also also be positive because as we've talked about before, whenever somebody gets upset at a piece of content, I'll, I'll say like there's a lot of normal NPC people who get upset at content. They, they feel like they have to leave comments on every piece of video that they watch on line. I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but like I read the comments of almost every single TikTok that I watch. I can't even remember the last time I left a comment on a TikTok though. Like if I scroll past a piece of content that I don't like or that I disagree with, I just don't leave a comment. But there's some people that just feel this innate desire, like this need, like I've got to tell everybody else how I feel about this. Right. So as a consequence, when that happens, like, let's say I imitated Ryan Trahan's video. If I do that, not only am I kind of guaranteed to be set up for success because it's a proven, I have a proven track record of content that's performed well, right? Like clearly this setup uh, has worked in the past, but then I also get a bunch of people who are going to be diehard Ryan fans. They're going to come over and be like, Hey man, you're copying Ryan. Hey man, you're copying Ryan. Hey bro, look at this. This guy copied Ryan, share, comment, share, comment, and even negative engagement. As we've come to learn on social media, in the eyes of the algorithm is still good engagement because the algorithm doesn't care if you're inter interacting with a piece of content positively or negatively. It just cares that you're interacting. That's why oftentimes you'll actually find that on platforms like TikTok or YouTube, especially on TikTok, what I've noticed is you'll get fed a lot of um, uh, really divisive content and maybe content that you don't necessarily agree with or don't necessarily like because the platform knows, the algorithm knows that like you're more likely to stick around and watch that content all the way through because even if you don't like it, you're going to stick around to watch it you know so that's why that's why i don't know if you guys have noticed but i've noticed it after i've used tiktok sometimes or especially after i use twitter i don't really get off the platform in the best of moods and a lot of the times that's because the algorithm has done a really good job of feeding me content that doesn't make me happy <laughs> um so in this situation i feel like um it can definitely be beneficial for a creator to uh to plagiarize it, it, it's not just that the creator can get away with it. It's also that they'll get away with it and it'll be even better than them spending their own time coming up with like original pieces of content. Checked it out, but it's like a word for word, exact replica of someone else's video. Yeah. Um, and it's something that we're seeing a lot across thumbnails, titles, videos. And I'm curious, 
That frame And it's something crazy. that we're seeing a lot across thumbnails, titles. Oh my God. Like what's the only thing that's different? The number? The number of myths? Okay, so let's see who gets the credit who did it first. One year ago, the Stokes twins. They also got the most views on it. W, they got the most views by far too. Hell yeah, that makes me happy. Good. I, my heart would have been broken. I mean, I guess that's, to be fair, that's probably the only reason that these guys also decided to do it is because this video clearly blew up unusually big for them. But man, that's also kind of like, I'll end up talking about more about this later, but this is kind of why I've started to shift my content, man. I, I, I can't, I just, I don't like playing this game. Videos, and I'm curious from your perspective, like, you know, in your book, you talk about reverse engineering a car, right? Like taking it apart, taking apart the car to like see how it works. Mm -hmm. D do you think like what we're seeing online right now with people, you know, word for word copying other people's videos is, is part of that process of finding your voice or is that something else? Well, you know, I think part of the problem is, is that people <laughs> used to be able to practice in private, you know, like if you were a painter a couple hundred years Yo, ago, Milner, what's up, man? if you were going to copy a master's painting to try to figure out I've literally out got Project works, Reboot open right now. And I just saw that you posted a, an update for Reboot 3. You do that in your studio. Like 10 minutes Nowadays, ago. Nowadays, uh, I worked. You do that in your studio. Nowadays, uh, you know, it's really easy to just do that and do it in public and see if, it, you know, and see if it furthers you along somehow. The easiness of sharing, I think, is a big thing that we're up against. Making and sharing used to be really, like, far apart, you know? I mean, you'd have to spend so much time making the thing, and then you'd have to figure out how to distribute it. And now you know, with your iPhone, it's like instantaneous, you know, like you can, the making and mm. the sharing is like that. For me, that's part of it is that it used to be yeah. that you could kind of work on your craft and kind of work on things in private uh, before you kind of shared it. Now with YouTube videos, it's like, well, you never, you don't really know if they work unless they're online, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know- To an extent, I, I think there, there are some creators that have been doing this for long enough that they know innately. Like there's some creators that just, also if you have enough momentum, there's just some creators that are like, this video is gonna bang because I've been doing this long enough and I know what kind of content does well and I know how to formulate this video. Uh, but what he is saying is true to an extent because the algorithm has changed a lot over time and it is always kind of fluctuating and as the trends fluctuate too I, I think the algorithm for the most part has gotten pretty refined to the point where like uh it's really hard and this is kind of a, i don't know some people might consider this a hot take it's um i think it's really difficult to make genuinely good content on youtube and not get recognized for it i know that's kind of like a hot take because some people might get offended by that in the sense that like well i've been doing youtube for a long time and my content you know hasn't hit recommended at all and i've been doing youtube for five years and i still only have 100 subs um i think in that situation it's kind of a wake-up call that like you're just not making content that people genuinely want to watch it and, and maybe that's not your goal maybe your goal isn't to get like super big and become a mr beast or be able to do youtube full-time maybe you're just genuinely sharing stuff for friends and family that you think is entertaining and it's just for you know it's just for entertainment value for you and you just enjoy the process um but youtube's youtube as an algorithm it's gotten pretty good and again, the algorithm, I feel like this will be my last point before we continue watching the video. Creators kind of will like blame this boogeyman algorithm in a sense for like, hey, my video didn't do well because the algorithm sucks today or blah, blah, blah. Uh, the way people got to start looking at it is like, dude, the algorithm is people. You've got to remember that at the end of the day, the algorithm has one goal and that's to deliver content to the people that want to watch the content, right? So you, you, you can't be blaming the technology when really what's most likely happening is you're just creating content that people don't enjoy watching. Um, and then it's up to you to kind of use the information and the tools and the evidence given to you and say, okay, what can I do to improve my content? And again, it's not perfect. And I do think there are certain elements of the algorithm that need to be worked on. Um, and while I do believe my statement wholeheartedly that I, I, I could, we could go down a whole situation where I kind of like self rebuttal, but I won't do that here. We're going to continue the video. You're also this dealing gonna be like with a medium minutes long. where people are judging the quality of something based on metrics that really have nothing to do with what I would consider real value or art or anything. Really, mm -hmm. I mean, whether a video goes viral or not really has nothing to do with its, um, you know, what it does for the world. Yeah, mm -hmm. I can spend five weeks on something and post it online and crickets chirp, and then I can do the most half-assed, lame thing I can think of, and it gets two thousand likes. Yeah, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right, what does that right. mean when you make things based on quantified results? It changes the kind of work you do and it changes the way you do work and the only argument i'd give to that is i think the the quantitative results that you're getting 
are results that are tied to people's enjoyment of your content. And so in the in the form of like video, I guess I agree uh, that it works in that scenario, but for other art forms, it, you know, it's not an insanely good metric. But again, too, like that's such an abstract point to make is it's like, you know, you know, is your is your the art that you made good for the world? I would argue that really all your YouTube video needs to do is just speak to people at a core level. You just need to when you're releasing a YouTube video, I, we're just going to talk about YouTube for the sake of making this conversation easier. Is like you just need to be releasing content that's just going to give people dopamine. That's really just at, at a core level, I guess that's what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to create a piece of content that people enjoy, releases some sort of dopamine that either feel like connection with you or they enjoy the content, they enjoy what you're doing, they enjoy the concept, whatever. It needs to speak to them. Um, and I think if you're doing that, I, I think in that sense, then the not only will it get recommended, but then I think that is something that's meaningful for the world. But then you can also make the argument that any kind of art is meaningful to the world and blah, 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 blah. Um, and it's just something that's that's that I think our culture is trying to work out right now. Yeah, I think the viewership is an extra validation point, an external validation point that can tip yeah. people over the edge of, oh, I want to imitate that. Because before social media, you had to like Jimi Hendrix or Kurt right. Cobain, yeah. and you had to see the validation in Rolling Stone magazine yeah. or maybe later on in MTV, and then you go, okay, that's something I want. I will copy elements of that. Today, you know, you don't even have to be famous to put out something that has a metric next to it that people want to copy. But the other thing about all of this is it's so completely subjective. I mean, it's <laughs> really, you know, one man's plagiarism is another man's, you know, art. And so it really is, it is It is a tricky thing. I, I stop drinking G personally, I think it's the elevator test. And what I mean by this is if you meet someone who's ripped you off, um, do you pat them on the back and say, you know, that was pretty cool what you did with my stuff? Mm -hmm. Or do you punch them in the face? You know, I mean, it's that, <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Like, are you going to get punched in the face if you you meet these people ever in an elevator and that is something kind of interesting um i befriended a guy named ali abdal do you know him yeah, yeah of course yeah. Yeah. ali's great yeah. so ali i was familiar. like i mean he reached out to me and was like he read show your work and mm -hmm. he said, this book changed my life. Like, this is why I do this. It was an example of how, like, I wrote this book, he read it, and now he does it better than I do it. You know, you know what I mean? Mm. Right. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I think I've started to I know that guy. think about why it makes me uncomfortable or why I'm angry to talk about the elevator test. Why sometimes do I see someone's work and want to punch them in the face? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in that scenario. Yeah. And I think I've realized that part of it is because I want to be singular. Like, I want to be an individual. The identity that I'm building, I want to protect. And right. even in business, it's important to be singular. You know, you yeah. don't want just any soda. You want Coca-Cola. You want this brand versus that. And what I've realized is that that's actually what makes me uncomfortable. And maybe it's a little bit of ego in that. But when I see someone copy me, I say, no, I'm I'm me. I'm working hard to be me. Right. You you can't be me just like that. Do you? Does that resonate with you as a creator? Do you think about that element of how individual you are or being singular? Oh, absolutely. Right now, I have this collage technique that I'm using that is very simple, but it looks very complex and people are very interested in. It. Everyone keeps asking me how to do it and I won't show them. I know myself well enough that if other people do it, it's going to make it not fun for me. I'm not going to want to do it anymore. Now, yeah. that's the kind of small part of myself. It's something I'm just keeping for myself because I do believe that like as we could become people with audiences, I think it's really important to find like find little things that you could do like to hold on to for yourself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Super cool. I like that a lot. One thing. That is a really great point. I think that kind of separates uh, sort of what I would consider to be content creators that are in it for a sense of like self-validation and content creators are that are just in it for like the fame or the money or some other like external element. Because oftentimes what I think you'll find with creators like Ryan Trahan that they kind of introed with or like I've noticed this a lot with like a creator like Laserbeam for an example is like those creators hold themselves to a standard and they take pride in the fact that their content is unique and a lot of what makes their content special is them as individuals so if you're somebody who creates a lot of that sort of what i would consider to be like maybe normie npc content maybe you won't necessarily care about somebody copying you because you don't really care about your image as a creator being super unique or special um or exclusive to you right you're just trying to create the most viral sensational thing you possibly can and if that means 
you came up with the idea yourself or you copied somebody else who did it before you, it doesn't really matter. Whereas if you're somebody like Ryan Trahan or Laserbeam or I don't know, I'm having trouble thinking of other creators that really, you know, uh, that, that kind of pave a way uh, that kind of have their own unique style and voice and feel to a video. When you're one of those creators, you probably won't want to copy. And you'll also probably take extra offense when somebody copies your work too, because it feels like somebody's just kind of munching off of your success when you feel like you put in effort that they will never have to put in. The thing I think about with ego is there is a deep need in all of us to be an individual, but to also be part of something, right? It's like to be special, to be an individual, but to be known for something, but you also wanna be part of something. And those two desires yeah. create like a really interesting tension for creative work. It's like this very tricky thing as an artist, because you you do, you want to be the guy on stage, but you also want to be part of something. You know, you want to have like a, a, a mm. what I call a genius. You know, you want to be a genius, but you also want a genius. Uh, genius <laughs> is the word that Brian Eno uh, uses uh, to describe the kind of collective form of genius. This idea that if you look at some of the great scenes like New York in the 70s, a lot of these bands, like they rose out of a genius, not just out of their own genius. It was because they were connected to the scene of people that like great work came out. And that's hard work meets opportunity. I mean, your work comes out of being connected to all these different creators and stuff like that. I think what's really interesting about some of the examples that you've brought up is that they are pre-internet, pre-social media. Yeah. Anyone who's creative is doing something that's very ancient. Like this idea, yeah. looking at the world and saying, there's something that's not here that needs to be here. Here. That's like a very ancient, you know, thing. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, that's a perspective I've never really had when it comes to content creation. And I'll just throw this out there. Maybe they end up talking about this, but I, I got to get this point out because this this point means a lot to me as a creator. This is the whole reason I started. I started YouTube, I think for two reasons. I started it because, I don't know, I'm somebody that really likes routine and structure. And so this is kind of the first smaller part. It was, it was something for me to do kind of after I came home from school every single day. And I kind of liked that it was like a grind. And I think for me, I was searching for an inner sense of self-worth. I didn't give a shit about like adding value to, um, or, and, uh, I, oh, how do I want to word this? I didn't get, I didn't care about adding something to the world that didn't already exist. There's plenty of creators who make very similar content to me in the sense that they make gaming content, they sit and they talk and they kind of share their experience of like playing Fortnite or playing Call of Duty or playing any game, right? That's not a new thing at all. And there's people that are to do it, I would argue better than I do. I make content and I originally started making content because I think for me, deep down, I grew up and especially in high school, I didn't have a whole lot of self-worth. Um, I wasn't a super confident person. Um, I thought highly of myself, but I, I felt like I didn't really have a whole lot of respect. Um, or I, I don't want to say I felt highly messed up because that sounds pompous, but like I had confidence in myself and my abilities, but I felt like I didn't, I felt like I didn't have respect. So for me, making content and starting this content creation journey was a way to get people to notice me and pay attention to me and care about me. And this isn't like, I'm not trying to say like my parents didn't give a shit about me, but I, I'm saying like, like, like a larger society. Like I wasn't the cool kid. I wasn't the super athletic kid. I wasn't, you know what I mean? Like I didn't fit into those categories. So I needed something else to be good at. And I think subconsciously that's kind of what YouTube was for me. So for me, it wasn't about adding something something into the world that didn't exist. That wasn't my thought at all. It was about, for me, it was, you know, getting a little bit of self-validation and gaining some satisfaction from it that I couldn't get anywhere else. Is really yeah. the thing. And that, and that is really, that is why I don't like, that's another way to come at the imitation thing. Because the really great creative work comes from, I read all these books, but the book I really want to read, I can't find it. I should write that book. So like yeah. on YouTube, it's like, I've watched all these YouTube videos, but I haven't seen seen this one YouTube video, someone should do this and then you do it. That is real, that is the real creative impulse. Something should be here that's not here. Or these two things mm. should be together. Someone should put these two things together and that's gonna be me. The imitation thing is, this thing's already here. I like this, maybe I'll do this too, right? That's imitation. And so once mm. you could get past you know, look, in the early days, you yeah, have Gabe, to I'm just live on Twitch once and Once you can get to that spot where you're like, there's something missing here. Maybe I can do the thing that's missing. That's when you find your work. So do you ever Ooh. wonder what you would do with a 
million dollars? Like how would you invest yeah. it back into your business? So no Spotter, the sponsor of today's video has paid out $740 million to creators like Mr. Beast, Dude Perfect, Eric, Destroying, and 400 more creators through catalog licensing deals. We'll explain that in a second, but here's how the creators hmm. are spending that money. 26% are spending their capital on higher quality content. 21% are spending it on production facilities. 13% are investing the money into launching their own brands and products. And 9% are hiring video editors. So if you're a creator who's uploading YouTube videos, then your videos will not only continue to increase in viewership, but also in revenue. Instead of waiting for that revenue to come in over the next few years from your old videos, Spotter will pay creators in cash up front that they can then invest in different parts of their business. Spotter's goal is to accelerate a creator's growth. And they're doing it not just with the capital, but also with the knowledge. We hosted a summit with Spotter and a bunch of top creators, all with the effort of learning how to put wow, the capital cool. to use to actually cool accelerate there. their businesses. <laughs> So head to spotter.com slash Colin and Samir and see if you're eligible to partner with Spotter. All right, back to the episode. It sounds like a really cool opportunity for creators. I, I haven't checked it out yet, so this is just speculation, but I would worry about uh, whether or not they're asking for ownership of channels, which I think might be kind of predatory. We'll see. With how fast everything's moving on the internet right now, the amount of output that's you know out there creatively, is there is there any such thing as an original idea or are there any original ideas left? Yes. I think yes. I mean, I think that, you, you know the and i think there always will be infinitely original, um but there are ideas that take yeah. us places we haven't been before and there are sounds we haven't heard um i think that the culture right now this is really funny because i'm the steel like an artist guy but the thing i wrote about in the 10th anniversary uh um afterward is i said i think we've taken it a little too far <laughs> <laughs> you know, mm. um, we're really good at taking things. We're not great at t thinking about where we're taking things to. That was Jean-Luc Godard's thing. He's like, it doesn't matter where you take things. It's where you take them to. And mm. wow, look at deep. every Holy Hollywood shit. remake, comic book, whatever there is, how interchangeable everything feels. Um, yeah. One of the things I think is really interesting about AI is that yeah, I was the reason say. AI images look so sort of uncannily good to people is that everything's so mediocre right now. I mean, that's how I feel <laughs> is that, you know, on the whole, like we're kind of a culture <clears throat> of mediocrity right now. I mean, we, you know, there's a kind of uh, a sameness to, you know, like you look at a CGI and movies and like a lot of it looks all the same. Um, it's very. Yeah, I could make an argument for that, though, that I think it just looks the same because it looks really good. <laughs> We've gotten over point where you've made it look really good. That's a really interesting point, though, that he made about AI. I like that. Because, yeah, I, AI art also isn't really... I, I refuse to believe that we're at a point where AI is is truly being creatively unique. I think it's still... It's still amazing what AI is able to do right now. I'm not trying to diminish that. I'm, I'm not one of those guys that's like, AI is a bunch of, like, if-then statements. But I'm saying that I think AI is still just kind of... Kind of still imitating a lot of what it sees online and it's not really doing anything original. And that's where I would argue that we don't really have to worry about AI taking over art because I think part of what makes art special to human beings, and this doesn't apply to every piece of art, but I think innately what makes art special is it was it a piece of art was made at a specific point in time by a human being that's had experiences, they've had doubts, fears, joys, moments of happiness. They have things they believe in. They have things that they disavow. And mixing all of that collective human experience into a person that then put that piece of art on a canvas or put it into music is something like that process. Yeah, AI will be able to imitate it, but if it's done by AI, it won't have that same soul behind it. AI will never have soul. Um, and regardless of whether or not people will ever give a shit about this in the future is a whole nother discussion. But I think truly what makes art special is it was made by somebody who has, who's had experiences, right? And I don't know if that's the greatest way to put that, but I, that's kind of how I classify art and that's what makes art special. Rare to come across something that looks new and interesting and exciting. And so I think it's really interesting how AI is really good at like doing something middlingly great. And it's like, well, yeah, cause that's what kind of, 
that's what everyone else kind of does too, you know? Yeah. Mm. We're also at this cultural moment mm. where people are really limiting what they'll I don't take really disagree in. with them necessarily. I mean, I don't want to get too deep into this because it really makes people upset these days. But there's this kind of culture right now where, oh, you can't separate the artist from the art, from the art. And you don't want to, you know, take in things that aren't, have the seal of approval from whoever is giving out the seal of approval these days. I think one thing that's going to happen in the future is that <laughs> I see this kind of future in which there's some kid who starts watching what everyone says they can't watch anymore or, or goes back in time and picks up really good tips from things that, uh, you know, that are supposedly out of date or are supposedly out of style or aren't, you know, correct anymore. And I think they're going to do something really interesting with them because I think one of the things that's really hmm. true about the artists that I like is they go deep into the past. And I mean, not like... 50 50 years, I mean, like a thousand years into the past, you know, mm. I mean, like there's a deep, rich tradition of art and culture and ideas uh, that, you know, most people don't read a book that's more than 10 years old, you know, and so I think immediately the way to be original um, is to go back further than anyone's willing to go. It, you know, instead of ripping off the mm. people you really admire, you should figure out who they're ripping off and who they admire. And then you rip off the people that those people admired. And pretty soon you have a whole family tree of creativity from which you can draw on. And your work becomes really, really deep that way. I think that's a really good point and a cool perspective to have. Kind of what he's saying is like, hey, just follow the opposite of trends. Like if you really want to be, because also what we're kind of talking about here is art being unique. I mean, that's kind of what this whole video is about, copy paste culture of YouTube. But um, if you just do the opposite of trends, you know, just do what was popular 10 years ago or, you know, do, you know, format your YouTube videos like an old movie. I don't know. I feel like that's kind of in principle what he's what he's arguing. That's an interesting perspective, though. I kind of like that. It's just going against the grain, which I think YouTube could use a lot of right now, because while I think like overall the Mr. Beastification of YouTube, I know some people don't like that term, but while the Mr. Beastification of YouTube has done a lot of good for YouTube, it's helped legitimize the YouTube scene and it's helped give people a lot of cool opportunities. Um, I think in a way it sucked a little bit of the soul out of YouTube a little bit. That's actually something that is happening on YouTube. There's a group of younger creators that refer to themselves as the YouTube new wave, and they're going back in time, not a thousand years, but perhaps a thousand in internet yeah. seconds, in internet mm. years. And they're going back maybe five, six years to a slower paced era of YouTube. And, and so it's oh, funny that interesting. It, it is it is kind of happening. Uh, yeah. yeah, it reminds me like when we first started uploading YouTube videos, we were very much, you know, enamored and infatuated with Casey Neistat and, uh -huh. you know, his content's amazing. basically made replicas of his vlogs, but with our life, which wasn't as interesting. Right. And I think you mentioned that of like, it's the content that matters. We were we were ripping off the style, but our content wasn't as interesting as mm -hmm. him. And yeah. then I recall when, you know, really diving into his world and learning that he used to work with an artist named Tom Sachs. And then looking at Tom Sachs's YouTube videos and going, oh, he was inspired <laughs> by Tom Sachs. And then going down that pipeline and seeing some of the other editors he was working with, like Max Joseph and Oscar Boyson and being like, there's a whole world. And that term you use, senius, it's like he yeah. emerged from this amalgamation of all these different people he was around to develop the style that was uniquely his. But if you go back to what he was inspired by, you can actually draw more inspiration. And I feel like we were able to then work out of that by understanding what scene was he a part of. Bingo. As you said that, I'm recognizing that's something that happened in our world. Now, my friend Alan Jacobs calls that swimming upstream. Yeah. You, you kind of swim upstream and figure out where this stuff is coming from. And yeah. to me, it's about being a student. It's about researching. It's about finding out where this stuff comes from. I always tell people, I let, say, look, if you can do one more Google search than everybody else, it puts you so much further ahead, you know? Yeah. I think this comes from my, my first job out of college was as a reference librarian. So I learned very early on how to research and find stuff really quickly. And I think a lot of what I offer people is I just kind of go just a little bit deeper than, you know, most, most people. Like somebody will see a quote on the internet and they'll be like, this is nice. I'm going to put it on my Pinterest. And I'm like, where does this come from? Who is this writer? What was the book it's from? And then I read the book and then it connects to this other book. You know what I mean? It's mm. just it's just like going one little step and looking up the thing. So when the reward for straight up 
plagiarism can be millions of views <laughs> and thousands of dollars. How do you pitch the reward for originality? <laughs> Like this is a long standing tradition in our culture, which is are you going to do the easy thing for uh, money and or are you going to do the hard thing that's rewarding? That's infinitely rewarding. I do wonder what people are chasing after. Uh, it, it really comes down to if you're chasing after numbers. Money and fame. Okay. Yeah, views. But if you're chasing after something else, and that includes a lifelong journey of being a creative person, bringing creative people into your life, then you kind of have to get more serious than just ripping off other people's stuff. Mm. You don't really have to be a religious person to find a lot of inspiration in in, you know, the Bible, which says, for what good is it for the man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? I mean, this is just really basic old stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, like, it. This it's, what are you going to do with your time on this planet? History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. You know, are you going to create videos that mimic other people and get a million hits? Or are you going to try to advance yourself and advance the culture? It's really a personal choice. But that's always been true of everything on earth is that you have to make that decision. Are you going to yeah. try to do the easy thing that is rewarding or are you going to go after the big rewards, which is becoming, you know, a real human being? <laughs> <laughs> a good way of putting you know? it. That's a great way of putting it. <laughs> I love that. But, um, you know, it's, uh, but it'll, it'll mess you up. You know, it'll mess you up. It's real yeah. easy to just do the easy thing. So, you know, don't read too much Thoreau or deep philosophy. It'll ruin your, uh, your earning potential. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, man, that that was that was awesome, man. Yeah, that's that great. great. Like that's that's that good? that's ex that super interesting. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted to chat with you about. Like that that great. was spot on. What an awesome video. I'm sorry if you guys got annoyed with me pausing and talking so much throughout it, but wow, that was awesome. Ryan Trahan, that ending monologue from Austin had me feeling like I was exiting the tunnel at the Super Bowl listening to We Ready by Archie Eversole featuring Bubba Sparks. Except instead of football, it's just my next YouTube video. And instead of wearing shoulder pads, I'm just in my boxers. Beautifully put, Ryan. That was a really awesome video. God, it's so hard to find content that's so like creator-centric like this. So again, guys, mad shout out to Colin and Samir. Go check them out if you guys haven't already. Oof.